Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The next topic is weekly updates from the OEC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. I give the floor to Mr. Alexander Hook, Principal Deputy Chief Monitor of the OEC Special Monitoring Mission. Good afternoon. Last week, the OEC Special Monitoring Mission registered a 10% decline in the number of ceasefire violations. For this week so far, our figures are preliminary. But this week, we see a similar trajectory. The sites have again made a recommitment to the ceasefire. Since it came into effect just after midnight on Wednesday, we have seen the decline in the number of ceasefire violations accelerate. I'm not naive. There are spoilers waiting in the wings. There are those who do not wish to cease fire, those who want to continue this conflict. But the recent decrease in the level of violence clearly points to the fact that there are also those who are willing, and crucially, who are able to stop the violence. I have met with many of these people on my trip to eastern Ukraine this week. People on both sides of the contact line, people who want to make a change for the better, who want to make small steps in the long walk towards peace. People who want to see gas, electricity and water supplies restored to civilians living along the contact line, willing to work together for the betterment of all. This week in Donbass, we note progress in this respect. Repair work has already been completed in one key civilian infrastructure project, and the work has started on another two. It is remarkable progress given that this work had been stalled for a number of years. Much more needs to be done, but one thing is clear. This can only be done through dialogue. We in the OEC SMM have facilitated dialogue and continue to stand ready to facilitate it. Dear friends, let's be clear. There are still ceasefire violations. Even since the latest recommitment, we have been recording them on a lower but nonetheless steady level. In all, since midnight on Wednesday, when the recommitment came into effect, we have recorded at least 370 ceasefire violations. There is also still a failure to disengage from the contact line. Last week, for example, we recorded ceasefire violations inside two of the three pilot disengagement areas, namely Stanitsa Luhanska and Petrivska. And we routinely see personnel and hardware in all three disengagement areas, and there are still mines everywhere. And crucially, there are many whose words still count for little. Last week, for instance, we were given explicit security guarantees that there would be windows of silence as repair works were ongoing at the Donetsk filtration station and in residential areas in nearby Avdivka. Instead of silence, our monitors who were facilitating and monitoring the work heard about 1,600 ceasefire violations. All of these factors, as we have seen on countless occasions in the past, allow for localized escalation. And last week was no different. In the Krimske, Sholobok, Donetsk area, in the Luhansk region, for example, uh, there was a marked increase in the level of violence. In just three hours, the OEC SMM recorded approximately 500 explosions in that area. The events in Sholobok, Krimske, Donetsk area on 23rd August underline how fragile the situation is. They once again demonstrate that Donbass is a tinderbox. Even with this last recommitment to the ceasefire, conditions on the ground, the presence of weapons and the proximity of the sites 
can act as a spark. So far the flames have been largely contained, but we know from experience that they can spread. We have seen many times before the bushfire of violence as it engulfs the entire length of the contact line. And we know what this entails for civilians living there. Even last week, a relatively good week, the OCSM monitoring officers confirmed that a 35-year-old man was killed in government-controlled Rubivka in Luhansk region. He had been at home at the time, in a scene that is common to thousands of innocent people on both sides of the contact line, his home, either deliberately targeted or caught in the crossfire, was shelled. The man subsequently died in hospital. Our monitoring officers saw that the roof of the deceased man's house had collapsed and windows had been shattered. Other houses in the settlement also sustained damage. Our monitoring officers are also currently corroborating information that there have been a number of civilian casualties in recent days in areas not controlled by the government. In non-government controlled Staro Mikhailivka, destruction was also observed by the SMM. There the SMM saw fresh damage to a church building and a residential house, both assessed as caused by rounds fired from an infantry fighting vehicle. Senseless loss of life, senseless destruction of civilian property, the senseless endangerment of civilians. Our monitoring officers also saw how the Mayorsk entry exit checkpoint was temporarily closed following violence in the area. The Mayorsk entry exit checkpoint is one of just five places along the 500 kilometer long contact line where people can cross. Thousands of people use it every week. Thousands are dependent on it for accessing pensions and medical care, for maintaining links with family and friends, for normal everyday contacts we all take for granted. SMM monitoring officers were close to Mayorsk on Monday. There they understood that the continuing effects of this conflict cannot be measured in numbers. No statistics can ever convey the wrenching loss felt by people there as they were unable to cross. Our monitoring officers met them as they waited for the checkpoint to reopen. Waiting in vain, some of them had been there for nearly two days, many of them desperate to cross. Some had life-threatening medical conditions that required treatment or specialized medicine available only on the other side of the contact line. Others needed to cross to maintain their IDP status and others were afraid that they would lose their pensions or social benefits which they rely on in order to survive. Others were trying to visit dying relatives. Many were in tears, pleading that the sites open additional entry exit checkpoints, that they operate them around the clock in a safe and humane manner. On Wednesday this week, I was at the entry exit checkpoint near Novotroitske. It too was closed temporarily as wildfires blazed nearby. Its closure, like the closure of the entry exit checkpoint in Mayorsk, underlines the urgent need for more entry exit checkpoints and longer opening hours. Dear friends, thankfully the entry exit checkpoint near Mayorsk reopened on Tuesday this week and the entry exit checkpoint near Novotroitske reopened early this morning. And meanwhile, the recommitment has come into effect. Despite everything, despite previous disappointment, despite many lost opportunities for peace, we are hopeful. We like millions of others in eastern Ukraine and all across the country, refuse to give up hope. We hope and expect that the people responsible for the violence, 
people responsible for the implementation of the Minsk agreements will finally do what they committed to doing four long years ago. Four years too late. But not too late now to underpin what is at this stage a shaky ceasefire. Not too late to withdraw the weapons, disengage and demine. To make this recommitment real. To match words spoken and written in Minsk with deeds in Donbass. To make the ceasefire agreed to four years ago and now recommitted to for the 14th time a sustainable, irreversible ceasefire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hook. Dear colleagues, if you have questions, you're welcome. No questions. Thank you once again. Uh, one, one question from Crimea News. Crimean News Agency, and I have the following question. Whether the SMM uh, received, uh, can you report any fresh information about the findings of investigation into a spionage scandal that was reported by RD channel? That's my first question. My second question, in September this year, it is planned that the OSCE coordinator, Tony Frisch, will visit Donbass and likely, most likely, visit uh, the detention facilities where Ukrainian prisoners are, are detained in non-government control areas and whether the OECSMA will be engaged or involved in this visit. Okay. Uh, thank you for these two questions. Uh, with regard to the allegations made uh, by the ARD a while ago, um, I would like to reiterate that we have launched a fact-finding mission into these allegations uh, and that we are still requiring more information to get to the bottom of these allegations. The OEC and the Special Monitoring Mission uh, as a field operation of the OEC has robust measures in place uh, to deal with possible misconduct. Uh, however, such misconduct must first be established uh, and I have no further update at this stage on that specific um, question. With regard to Ambassador Frisch's visit to Donbass, uh, at this stage I can only say that the SMM will be supporting and facilitating his visits. I can't speak on behalf of Ambassador Frisch, you would have to then direct substantive questions directly to him and his team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and one more. In this context, additional clarification whether the, the OECSMM has right now access uh, to detention facilities where Ukrainian prisoners are held in occupied territories and whether the Ukrainian side uh, addressed you with a request uh, to visit those detention facilities. Thank you. The Special Monitoring Mission engages with the armed formations on a regular basis and has also expressed interest to support visits to people held in areas not controlled by the government. In this context, we work very closely with the United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission and the International Committee for the Red Cross, who are specialized agencies with regard to these substantive questions. Thank you. If there is no more questions, thank you, Mr. Hook. Thank you.